Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Dispute Avoidance and Resolution. Today we're joined by two ASA's FIDIC trainers, Nikola Pavlovich and Ivana Panic. Nikola is the co-founder of construction-claim.com, as well as being a FIDIC trainer with ASA's and a member of the managing board of ASA's. He is also a steering committee of the EFCA Future Leaders. His areas of specialization include the negotiation, review, and management of FIDIC contracts and the preparation and defense of construction claims. He's joined by Ivana Panic, who is also a FIDIC trainer with ASIS and a member of the managing board of ASIS. Her areas of specialization include real estate, construction law with a focus on FIDIC conditions of contract, and construction arbitration. But before I turn the meeting over to them, I'd like to briefly introduce the ICCP for anyone who is joining us for the first time today. So what is the ICCP? Well, we are a professional members organization designed to recognize those who have the skills, qualifications, and expertise in the professional management of construction claims. Our objectives are to establish international professional standards for the management of claims and give recognition to those who have gained that knowledge, as well as help educate those who wish to gain experience in the management of claims. Why is there the need for the ICCP with so many professional organizations related to the construction industry? Well, our members come from many different professional backgrounds, from engineering, quantity surveying, project management, etc., and have moved into claims. And until the ICCP was established, there was no institute that specifically recognized those who have the specialist knowledge, experience, and skills to manage, prepare, and respond to claims to the highest levels of professionalism. To briefly introduce our steering committee, we have the executive officer, Andy Hewitt, our elected president, Paul Gibbons, and three fellows, Christian Grosskopf, Lee Sporl, and Mark Watson, who were elected by the membership. In terms of membership, we have three individual levels, associate, member, and fellow, each of which comes with its own set of requirements that must be met in order to achieve that level of membership. We also have a corporate level of membership for companies who specialize in claims or have departments that specialize in claims. So what are the benefits of membership? Well, we have a private members area with a growing knowledge base of articles, white papers, case studies, etc. on contractual and claims topics. We have a growing library of practical templates to help our members save time while refining their claims administration and management skills. We have practical technical CPD in the form of the ICCP Academy. We have a private LinkedIn group where members can discuss their contractual questions. We offer industry exposure in the form of a searchable database of members on our website, as well as the usual uh, certificate of membership that shows the designation, as well as a membership logo, which can be displayed in an email signature, LinkedIn profile, CV, etc., wherever you would like to show your membership. We also have an optional register of claims practitioners for our practitioners who would like to increase their web presence. If you'd like to know more about membership, please visit our website, instituteccp.com, or email me, jennifer.smith, at instituteccp.com, or membership at instituteccp.com, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And now on to today's presentation. Uh, CDRC. Uh, the main advantage of this uh, uh, construction dispute resolution center is that it is specialized only for construction 
disputes. Uh, uh, besides that, we have uh, administration of, dif of different uh, dispute resolution proceedings. Uh, besides the Construction Dispute Resolution Center, there are two uh, similar institutions which exist here in Serbia. One of them is permanent arbitration, uh, which is based uh, at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Serbia. And the second one is Belgrade Arbitration Center. But for the difference between uh, uh, these two institutions, uh, CDRC uh, is focused only on construction disputes, uh, while uh, those two existing institutions are dealing with the disputes uh, of uh, all the industries. Our main goals are uh, reduction of the administrative costs for dispute resolutions. Uh, as you are uh, already aware, the international dispute resolution centers are uh, tightly connected with uh, high, uh, high uh, costs. Uh, we are using simple and effective procedures for dispute resolutions. They are based on uh, ICC uh, rules. Competence uh, and expertise in construction business are one of our main uh, assets. We are engaging locally and internationally recognized uh, experts which are familiar uh, with uh, local, local legislation and as well as uh, international construction practice and uh, international standard forms of contract. Uh, competence, credibility, and quality uh, are also one of our main goals and assets. Also, all types uh, of uh, disputes can be resolved uh, in one of those two languages, whether it is uh, English or Serbian. Uh, we have uh, uh, four types uh, of proceedings. Uh, uh, we have uh, arbitration proceedings, uh, mediation proceedings, uh, dispute adjudication proceedings, uh, and of course, uh, expert proceedings. So uh, that is uh, briefly around the CDR Center. Ivana, would you like to add something? Uh, just to let you know that we are in the process of completing and finalizing the institution and expecting that uh, it will be open and run for any questions in the next month. So basically, even before, you can send us email or to access or to us and ask us anything if you're interested about this. That's on my end for now, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, for today, I prepared you one uh, of the case study, which is related to the dispute avoidance. Ivana, a few minutes later, will uh, present you one of the case study which is related to the dispute resolution on a DAB. So before we start uh, with the, the dispute, uh, I will just uh, give you a few basic uh, information about uh, the subject project. Uh, it was uh, executed in the Republic of Serbia. Uh, it is an industrial plant uh, building. It was financed by one of the largest international financing uh, institution. Uh, total value of the works was uh, 350 million euros. The time for completion was 36 months. Uh, uh, the owner and the end user of the utility uh, uh, was a public company, which was 100% uh, owned by the Republic of Serbia. Uh, the EPC contractor selecting for the engineering procurement and construction works was a uh, foreign construction company, one of the largest uh, in the subject uh, industry. Uh, and for the contract, uh, Silver Book uh, uh, FIDIC uh, edition 1999 was selected. Uh, there was already one glitch in that uh, contract. Uh, the offshore component of the works uh, was uh, uh, based on a lump sum basis, while the uh, onshore component uh, of the works was based on a unit rates. Uh, investment uh, was uh, brownfield, meaning that the existing uh, industrial plant, uh, which was fully operational, uh, should stay operational during the execution of the uh, new plant. Uh, besides the EPC contractor and the owner, we had uh, another entity which was included in the contract, uh, that was the uh, expert supervisor, the entity which is required by the Serbian uh, law, and the owner uh, engaged the foreign consulting company. 
all the information I provided herein are uh, related to the main contract. Uh, uh, the uh, EPC contractor on the other uh, side uh, signed the subcontract with the local construction company, which was related for the C part of the EPC, EA, the construction works uh, onshore component uh, of the works. Uh, and that is uh, the contract, which is important for our case study for today. Uh, that subcontract was uh, signed by a uh, FIDIC Red Book uh, 1999 edition. It was related to the onshore part of the works uh, based on a uh, unit rates. Uh, the employer was EPC uh, contractor, and there was one uh, anomaly in that uh, contract. Uh, uh, the employer was at the same time the engineer, uh, namely the EPC contractor didn't saw any advantage of engaging third independent party to be uh, the engineer because the expert supervisor, which was engaged directly by the owner, uh, was engaged for this contract uh, also. So, so there would be uh, another collision in authorities, responsibilities, and obligations. Uh, as I said, the subcontractor in this contract was the local construction company, uh, and the total value of the works was approximately 25 million dollars. The owner's main obligations uh, were uh, related to the brownfield investment. As I previously said, uh, the existing plant should be kept in operation all the time during the construction uh, of the new plant. Uh, as the, uh, it was a brownfield investment, the owner's obligations were a little bit different than in classical uh, silver uh, book uh, contract, uh, the owner had the obligation to provide geological conditions uh, to demolish uh, uh, some of the existing buildings, which were not uh, in the function anymore, including the removal of the RC foundation. This is a uh, very important uh, part for our uh, case study. Uh, basically, the uh, owner had the obligation to clear the site area before it is handed over to the EPC contractor. And finally, to provide the layout of the existing utilities which are in operation in order to enable the EPC contractor to complete the engineering design uh, and construction works without interference with the existing plant. Regarding uh, uh, demolition of the existing buildings, some of them were demolished years ago, uh, but without RC foundation, they remained uh, in place. Uh, unfortunately, the historical data regarding those existing buildings and uh, RC foundation locations was not uh, available at that time. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, everything below uh, the ground is removed, the owner had to excavate tens of thousands uh, of cubic meters of uh, hard soil, including dross from the existing plant, uh, at least four meter high, and then to do the complete backfilling of that uh, area and hand it over to the contractor. Uh, as you can guess, uh, the owner did not have enough time uh, nor uh, money to do the excavation. Uh, and uh, what actually happened uh, at the end, uh, the owner made the decision that uh, the site should be only leveled with uh, backfilling uh, materials. Uh, the RC foundation should uh, remain in place. Uh, he made the option to conduct uh, underground 3D recordings. Uh, unfortunately, as it will be shown uh, later, those 3D recordings were not uh, as precise and as uh, reliable as they thought it will be. Uh, the site uh, uh, was handed over to the EPC contractor and the owner took the risk for any potential delay and additional costs if and when the existing foundation should be removed due to collision uh, with the new plant buildings. Uh, on this photo, you can see basically the uh, the leveling uh, of, of the site is uh, completed uh, almost uh, perfectly. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the EPC contractor entered to the site area, knowing all this. 
uh, as we uh, mentioned uh, on the Fidi Cred book, the EPC contractor was at the same, same time the engineer and the employer. Uh, that uh, Fidi Cred book was uh, significantly changed. Just for your information, the particular conditions of the contract had more pages than the general conditions of the contract. Uh, that uh, Fidi Cred book was based uh, on a back to back principle. That means, basically, among uh, other things that the EPC contractor was obliged to pay to the subcontractor only for the works for which he received the payments directly from the owner. On the other hand, the EPC contractor uh, had the obligation to maintain the quality of the works and to prove at the end that the specified performances uh, can be achieved. And also the EPC contractor was responsible for the functioning of the plant during the entire defect certification period, uh, although the maintenance works was the owner's obligation. The expert supervisor, as I said, is an entity which is required by the Serbian law and it, act, and it acts uh, in accordance with Serbian law on planning and construction. Uh, his main goal is uh, to ensure that the works which are executed there in the site are in accordance with the construction permit, which is uh, issued by the competent, competent uh, authority uh, and design documentation, which is fully approved by the authorities. Besides that, the expert supervisor should take care of the quality of the works, including implementation of entire local legislation, including laws, rule books, standards, etc. Uh, also, he's in charge for checking and approval of the quantities of the executed works. He's checking the progress of the works uh, and he's approving the interim payment certificates but only related to the quantities. This is very important part. So he's not approving the unit rates. All the unit rates should be uh, resolved and agreed between the contract parties. Uh, and the expert supervisor is only approving the quantities of the works executed. Besides that, uh, expert supervisor is checking and controlling the execution of the works, which are covered during the construction uh, works. Uh, th this relates to all the hidden works, such as uh, reinforcement, uh, uh, waterproofing, foundation, which is important for our case study, etc. And among other things, uh, uh, the expert supervisor has the authority to give the instruction to the contractor if the works cannot be executed in accordance with design documentation issued for construction and construction permit including any potential change of underground conditions. Of course, as you can imagine, during the excavation, we found all the RC foundations which existed there. We didn't need uh, historical data uh, at all, but uh, luckily uh, for all those collisions, we found mutual understanding between the parties. We usually had two options. The two options. The first option was uh, to remove the existing RC foundations if they're directly colliding with the new uh, new plant, uh, and the other one if the collision was not so serious uh, that uh, they should remain undemolished. And it was the case until we uh, came to the execution and the excavation uh, for the RC uh, foundations. Uh, uh, you know, of the footprint of the new storage tanks. We had uh, two of those uh, tanks. Uh, they were 28 meters in diameter and the height of those tanks was uh, 10 uh, meters. Uh, when we encountered uh, uh, those RC foundations, we issued, uh, is, uh, issued notification in accordance with sub clause 4.12, uh, unforeseeable physical conditions, and we requested the instruction from the engineer, which was at the same time the employer. After this collision, we had uh, a site meeting uh, organized where all the parties were uh, present.
I will give you just a few photos here. Uh, this is what, what happened uh, when we started the excavation from that uh, perfectly leveled area. Uh, as you can see on these photos, we found uh, uh, RC channels, uh, we found uh, RC water basins, uh, which were full with uh, rubbish, uh, main holes, foundations, more of the foundations, more of RC foundations, and basically just for the brief information, uh, the new plant had approximately 10,000 uh, cubic meters of concrete. Uh, and while doing the excavation for those works, uh, we excavated more than 10,000 cubic meters of RC concrete uh, dross uh, and hard soil. So basically, this is the full, these are the two footprints of the new storage tanks, which are shown here. Basically, those two uh, circles, which you can uh, see here uh, on the photos. Uh, we organized, as I mentioned, we organized a site meeting. And from the very beginning of that meeting, we had the two opposite standpoints. Uh, the first, um, standpoint was of the owner and the expert supervisor. You should read this as from the guys who were paying for the execution of the works. Uh, their standpoint was that uh, the RC foundation should not be excavated, that it is not uh, uh, necessary, that they should remain uh, in place uh, and just uh, backfilling should be installed around them. Uh, and they believe that leaving them under the new storage tank would not affect the settlement of the new storage tanks. The option of the group number two, uh, which was consisted from the EPC contractor and the subcontractor, uh, you should read this as the guys who, who were responsible for the functioning of the plant. Uh, in their opinion, the existing RC foundation should be entirely removed and replaced with the backfilling material. In their opinion, leaving, of them, leaving them under the bottom of new storage tanks would have actually caused different settlements, which might affect the functioning of the storage tanks uh, and the plant in its entirety because the plant would have to stop if the storage tanks were not in function. Uh, after that uh, meeting where there was no alignment, uh, the subcontractor for the construction works uh, received instruction number one from the EPC contractor, EA uh, employer, EA engineer. And that uh, instruction was officially uh, issued in accordance with the conditions of the contract. Uh, basically, it said that all the existing foundations should be uh, removed, backfilling material should be installed uh, instead of existing RC foundations and compacted up to the module of compression of 80 MPAs. Uh, and that it was clear that the instruction represented variation order in accordance with the conditions of the contract. Uh, uh, the engineer's estimation was that uh, additional payment uh, of 100,000 euros was uh, necessary uh, and that uh, extension of time for completion uh, was not necessary, it wasn't applicable because uh, uh, this activity was not on a critical path of the project. It had a free float of four months. And as per the engineer's estimation, uh, the estimated duration for these works was approximately one month. However, on the other side, the subcontractor received the second instruction from the expert supervisor. Uh, the expert supervisor, as we said, uh, is acting in, in accordance with Serbian law, and uh, this instruction was written in the site diary, the only official uh, document for the Serbian law for communication between the expert supervisor and the uh, contractor. Uh, as we uh, already said, the expert supervisor had the opinion that the existing foundation should uh, remain in place, that the backfilling sh uh, material should be installed only around the existing foundations and compacted up to the model of compression of 80 MPAs. They were in alignment uh, with the engineer in view of the module of compression and that no additional expenses are expected since there is no additional works here. Uh, they did not uh, see that uh, any extension of time for completion was 
uh, required. Subcontractor was in the middle of the crossfire and it wasn't his fault. Uh, however, besides the subcontractor, the project was affected in it, its uh, entirety. Uh, uh, there were several meetings which were organized, letters and notices uh, exchanged, uh, but uh, no significant uh, progress uh, was made toward the uh, achievement of the alignment, uh, mutual agreement uh, about the actions which should be uh, undertaken. Uh, the, past, the time was passing and nothing uh, has changed. After three months, the activity which was not on a critical path, uh, which had free float of basically three months, became critical. It was delaying, it started to delay the project end date. And that was uh, the time where the subcontractor uh, had to choose his uh, between uh, three options. Option number one was to follow the engineer's instruction. Uh, at the end uh, of the day, it was uh, subcontractor's contractual obligation to follow the uh, engineer's uh, instruction. He should engage additional resources and demolish the existing RC foundations. That way, the subcontractor would prevent the delay of the project and uh, date uh, and of course he would take the risk that the expert supervisor, the entity acting in accordance with law of Republic of Serbia, will not approve the additional quantities of demolished RC foundations in total value of approximately 100,000 euros and that is a precondition for payment of uh, IPC to the EPC contractor and consequently to the contractor. The option one, uh, number two was to follow the expert supervisor's instruction. Uh, that was subcontractor's obligation in accordance with uh, applicable law. Uh, that way, the subcontractor would take the risk that there might be issues with functioning of the new storage tanks and plant in general due to different settlements of the RC foundations. And he would also uh, take the risk for not following the engineer's clear instructions, which are issued in accordance with the conditions of the contract. Option number three was to write letters and notifications and wait for the resolution of the issue. As you probably can guess, uh, the uh, subcontractor decided to go with the option uh, number one and to follow the engineer's uh, instruction. Uh, in view of that, uh, he demolished all the existing RC foundations, included the quantities in the construction book for that uh, uh, month, uh, made uh, uh, IPS, including those executed quantities and continued with the uh, works execution. Here are a few photos from the site. Uh, here you can see that uh, that bunch of rubbish and RC foundation is now gone. Everything is leveled and uh, backfilled. The con subcontractor installed the blinding, installed the reinforcement here for the base, here for the foundations, started with the concreting uh, works. Here you have a big picture of both of those tanks. As I said, they are both uh, 28 meters uh, in diameter. Here is the progress of the backfilling works. And finally, uh, this is uh, when we completed the backfilling uh, of uh, uh, those foundations and they were ready for the installation of large uh, storage tanks. As you can guess, the expert supervisor did not accept the quantities of the executed works and reduced the IPC for the value of additional works on the demolition of RC foundations because they were not done in accordance with the expert supervisor's instruction. Uh, formally, there, there still was no dispute uh, at the table, uh, namely the engineer and the subcontractor had the mutual understanding, they had the same uh, standpoint. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, subcontractor could not receive the payment for the value of the uh, executed additional uh, works uh, per conditions of the contract, per particular conditions of the contract. Uh, DAB was deleted 
Unfortunately, Ivana will probably correct me, but uh, in uh, my opinion, over 95% uh, of the contracts signed here in Serbia are signed without DAB existence. Uh, and we uh, warmly hope that it will be changed in the yeah. fu future, especially uh, in view of the new FIDIC uh, 2017 editions. Uh, but Ivana will say that uh, uh, more uh, on the dispute uh, resolution uh, case study. Uh, per the conditions of the contract, the next step for resolution of potential dispute was international arbitration, which was uh, very uh, costly. And the situation was following. The subcontractor could claim the EPC contractor for the value of additional works. However, due to close back to back, that probably wouldn't solve the problem since the EPC contractor also did not receive the payment for the subject works. On the other hand, the EPC contractor issued the instruction, clear instruction to the subcontractor uh, while he didn't receive the instruction from the owner and or expert supervisor. So it was very uh, tricky. Uh, what happened uh, at the end? The EPC contractor organized a meeting with senior management of the all uh, parties involved. On that meeting, the EPC contractor presented all the options, which I mentioned previously, and explained that the subcontractors' uh, actions were actually in the best uh, interest of the project. Uh, the reason was not to earn the money, but, but uh, to do the job properly and to hand over the product uh, which uh, had the quality in accordance with the conditions of the contract. Uh, in addition to this, the, even the most uh, important argument was that uh, during the excavation of those uh, files, uh, it was shown that the existing RC structures were not just RC foundations. As we saw, there were also tunnels, rubbish, uh, manholes, uh, a lot of uh, other things, uh, which uh, basically was uh, the air under the foundation. So if the contractor did not clear the entire footprint, uh, this would uh, remain unknown is, uh, to the expert supervisor and the uh, owner, as it couldn't be seen from the surface. And we, it would be uh, almost certain an issue in the future. The meeting was successful. The owner accepted the EPC contractor's uh, arguments uh, and accepted additional cost of approximately 100,000 uh, euros. The construction books were uh, approved, the interim payment certificate corrected and approved, and the formal dispute was uh, avoided. Uh, what we can learn from uh, this uh, case, uh, you will uh, uh, see that uh, basically all of the five golden principles uh, which were issued by the uh, FIDIC uh, were not followed at all. Uh, to be honest with you, they were written uh, years uh, after the execution of this uh, uh, project, but we will go just uh, uh, through three of them. Uh, golden principle number one defines basically that the party's roles and responsibilities should not be drastically changed. As we saw, this was actually the case here. The employer was the same as the engineer, so basically they were merged in uh, one entity. Uh, golden principle number three defines that the particular conditions of the contract should basically change only what has to be changed. Uh, as I said, they had more pages than general conditions of the contract, so this was also uh, not uh, the case. And uh, golden principle number five defines that DAB or DAAB uh, must exist depending on the contract which is uh, signed. Uh, as I mentioned, DAB is uh, deleted uh, and uh, this uh, uh, dispute uh, uh, before it became dispute could not be sent uh, to the DAB for the opinion. And for the end, uh, uh, one of the maybe most important recommendation is that whenever possible, the engineer and the expert supervisor should be the same entity. Uh, there are no legal obstacles and there is a lot of uh, 
uh, advantages for that. Uh, basically, the uh, authorities, uh, responsibilities, uh, and obligations of the expert supervisor uh, are contained uh, in the engineer's role, which is uh, uh, much uh, wider. Uh, but uh, if it is the same entity, they will be always online and you will not uh, be in position to have uh, uh, opposite instructions received from those two entities. Uh, as I said, fortunately, uh, on this uh, particular case, uh, the dispute was uh, avoided. Unfortunately, uh, this project was uh, very complex. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, there were many other disputes. Uh, some of them were directly related to the authorities and obligations of the parties involved, especially the engineer and the expert supervisor. Uh, and those disputes uh, could not be avoided or resolved amicably. This uh, project went to the arbitration, uh, which uh, has been completed uh, three years ago. Uh, that would be all for me for this uh, uh, presentation. If you, can, if you have uh, any questions, uh, you can send them to the QA box. In the meantime, I will share the screen now while you're answering the questions. Okay, I will stop. Super. Now you can share. Thank you very much. If there is Nicola. no questions. Ivana, the floor is yours. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Just one second. Ah, sorry. Do you see the screen? Just part of it. Ah, oh, I will now. Now you see it. Maybe to put uh, put it yeah, on yeah, the yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, I will. Just, yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Just a brief, uh, brief introduction on my end. Thank you, Nicola, for your uh, great presentation. It was really, really, it was really nice and interesting to hear how actually and what happens when we have possibility to resolve a dispute and not to end up finally in the dispute resolution procedure, which would be the case at hand that I'm speaking about. But before we start. Uh, so you have definitely avoided any disputes, arbitration. Have you ever actually been in the DEB in arbitration after impossible, uh, after impossible dispute? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, do you have any case when you actually end up in the arbitration or dispute? Because as you said, it was it is huge. It is huge, hugely costly, and uh, the parties definitely should be trying to avoid it by any case. Just one second. Give me a couple of minutes to come. Yes, to my I said. Part. Yeah. As I said, uh, this uh, dispute was uh, avoided. This yeah. was just potential dispute, but on this very project, there were many other disputes which could not be, uh, uh, which weren't avoided. They could be avoided, but they weren't. So this uh, very project uh, was uh, ended uh, on international arbitration, which was very costly. And there it was successfully uh, finished three years ago. So. so you won practically everything, both of them. Uh, not both not of them. Really. Uh, lost a lot of time, nerves, uh, money, and everything. Yes, but, of course. Uh, yeah, of it course. was a very we're, complex project. Yes, fully clear. My project now, which we're speaking about, is in Montenegro. Uh, it was. It is very similar in to some extent to case Nicola was talking about Red Book. Always fit the credit book, mo most, mostly used here in the region. Uh, basic, I will now tackle basic legal issues and explain what actually the project was about. It was the underground construction, uh, also always having the underground constructions an issue. Design was provided by the employer on the project. Basically, employer did all the geotechnical, geological da data and provided to the contractor. However, since the certain circumstances changed, uh, in comparing to one that were provided in the original tender documents, when actually work started and when actually contractors started to execute the works, it appeared that all data which were provided were actually wrong. And that all methodology and everything that contractor plan at the beginning for execution of the work couldn't be done as it was originally envisaged under the tender document. And now what? Always the question, now what? Of course, claim, which we claim with a high amount of uh, additional works and due to the change circumstances was submitted by the contractor. 
However, the employer, of course, did not want to accept those new additional works and based on the change circumstances. On which grounds? Just one second, we have a chat. Ah, okay, super. Based on which grounds? Two key legal grounds were actually used to defend the employer, to defend the contractor's and employer's position. On the side of the employer, it was stated firstly, which is very interesting from the aspect of local law, that the statute of limitation ran uh, on the claims of the contractor, because of course, huge amount of time has passed. While you come to the DAB procedure, and Nicola said, you start from a claim, then it takes a lot of time if parties actually try to agree and disagree whether they will accept. Then you have the expert opinion maybe during the engineer determination. Then you start the DAB proceeding and it can take up to several years from the moment where works are actually completed or partially completed. Second aspect that the employer tried to state was that you cannot actually claim based on the changed circumstances, because in the tender documents, we had clearly prescribed provisions stating that the, the employer will not take any liability for the data provided in the geotechnical study. Nicola, what do you think about that? It's very funny, you can say, when basically you exclude all liability uh, in the tender documents. Just one second, I have, ah, it's working, okay. Yes, sorry, I have a technical issue today, obviously. <laughs> So uh, we had two base, basically two legal points, set of limitation and building permitting process that, uh, that was run uh, due to the situation that the tender documents was wrong. Nicola, how many times have you read in your contract provision stating the employer will take no responsibility whatsoever with the data that are provided in these documents? Especially for the red book, uh, for the design, yes. he, the employer is not responsible for the yes. design of the work. Exactly, works. exactly, exactly. Which is quite funny. And why did we end up in the DB proceeding? Because the employer thought its claims and its position basically were proof, uh, pro, 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 stand, stand proof. Bulletproof. Bulletproof, exactly. From one end, set of limitation for sure ran. And on other way, we of course have a contract saying that there would be no liability whatsoever. Just a brief legal explanation on why this is wrong. Uh, firstly, its question is how do you actually calculate set of limitation in the claims which are provided by the contractor or the employer? Do you calculate it actually from the moment of the submittal? Do you calculate it from the moment of, uh, of the final payment certificate? When actually the set of limitation starts? So we had there a lot of disagreements and agreements in the DAB proceeding with the UK, uh, UK DAB member, uh, trying to explain and try to connect FIDIC and FIDIC deadlines with set of limitation under the local law. And this basically applies to all, over the, to, to all countries in the region. So what is the conclusion, joint conclusion here, that set of limitation actually runs from the final certificate, from the final payment certificate. So, but when is the final payment certificate? Which is a tricky question. Is it final payment certificate, one that was that is done up to the end of the project or the one that is actually done after the expiry of the defect notification period? Nicola, what do you mean, what do you think? <laughs> we had a lot of issues with that. Uh, we had one project where this was defined uh, to be basically a statement at completion and the interim payment certificate, which is done basically 84 days after taking over certificate. While on the other, we had basically the performance certificate, exactly. which was considered as the final payment certificate. In yes, that, that is that is actually the issue because the court practice, which is quite very different in the Serbian region, Montenegro as well, said state that the status of limitation for claims in relation to the price of works carried out under the construction contract starts to run on the first day after which the contractor could claim payment on the base of the final account. So that's the million dollar question. What is the final account? And of course, uh, it provides huge amount and ground, huge grounds for any future disputes. I will know. I will let you know at the end what were the conclusion uh, from the DAB member, but not yet. Uh, second issue, uh, as I mentioned, was the wrongfully provided tender documents. As everybody knows here, especially in the region, mm -hmm. works are provided only 
are only after a building permit is issued. Building permit is issued. This is an old law in Montenegro, but it's very similar to the current one here. Uh, works are issued. So works are executed on the basis of the building permit. Building permit is issued on the basis of the main design. Main design to be elaborated. Here are more engineers, I guess, and lawyers. You know this better than me. But in order to prepare main design, you have to have input data. You have to have proper input data on the basis of which you prepare main design. But imagine this. When employer prepares the main design and not the contractor, and it provides a building permit and the main design to the contractor and states, I will not take any responsibility. But the contractor should verify all the data which is provided in the tender documents. Can you imagine that? Having a tender proceeding and 10 contractors all digging holes and trying to prove whether, for example, the geological data are correct or not. Nicola, it, it is really, it is unreasonable, correct? That's right. Yeah. However, it is in the contract and it is stated like that. So uh, here, what actually happened in reality was that when the contractor starting executive works, instead of, of soft rock, there was a hard rock and basically it had to use the explosive instead of initially envisaged methodology that was planned. So it obviously affected it a lot the execution of works and the time for completion and everything. So it was it was a huge claim for additional payments and for additional work that were provided by the contractor. But the employer said, no, the contract says the contractor must verify all the data. However, can you really, when you look at the local laws, can you really rely on the wrongfully provided data? Can you really rely on that? So what the law says, the project is subject to the technical, the geological investigation is subject to technical control. Technical control is carried out by the investor through the company. This is under the law. Company or expert legal entity performing technical control is responsible for any errors in the geological exploration. A geotechnical investigation is the part of geological investigations. These were basically the da data that were provided uh, for the design. So should really the contractor do the separate geotechnical investigation. Let's look at the FIDIC a bit. What FIDIC says, 4.10 says, I don't have it now in front of me, but basically the contractor should verify that data to extent reasonable. It should rely on the data provided by the employer and it should verify to extent reasonable. Is this reasonable? Nicola, what do you think? Well, it depends. What is, uh, what should be checked? Uh, I had the issue on this EPC contract where some similar provision was provided. On the other hand, uh, was the EPC contractor yeah. and uh, he had uh, uh, no obligation to check the data received from the owner. So it was uh, also a little bit long shot because uh, uh, in EPC contracts, uh, you cannot sign the contract and uh, not be reliable for the ground conditions at all. So it depends what reasonable is. Exactly. And what is also when you say reasonable, we should always take a uh, look into the money you use for that and the time you have for that. If we have a tender proceeding and you should submit a bid. Obviously, there is not sufficient time maybe to do all the, to practically recheck all the data. So what we claimed here was that the geotechnical investigation could not have been procured by the contractor due to duration of the tender procedure, which was not sufficient for such investigation, even that this was possible. So even that, this is additional argument, the contractor could not apply for and obtain all necessary approvals and permits for performing activities, because of course you have to have relevant permits in order to do these studies from the competent authorities and the owner of the con uh, concerned lands. It was, a long, it, it was a long part of the road, basically. It, so it, it would take all these segments to check, to verify all the data. And cost of such investigation uh, that would require could not be borne solely by the contractor, uh, neither which is the practice. So this, <laughs> this was the argument that we have used. Yes, Nicola, yes. <laughs> Uh, someone might ask the question there, yeah. why would the contractor sign the contract? Exactly, that he exactly. <laughs> and that was the employer argument. But we said, based on the local laws, can you really rely on your wrongful act? Can, yeah. re can employer really be protected by relying on his wrongful act? So we said the further, further uh, argument that we used, that the employer procured the submitted technical investigation, that the contractor had the right to rely 
had the right to rely on yet technical investigation based on the local laws and having in mind everything which was said. That the employer cannot benefit out its own bad faith. Can you? Th that is the argument. That is the most important part. Yeah. Exactly. And could then the employer who provided all these data argue that their geotechnical investigation contained possible errors? And thus the contractor had to perform its own investigation because what does it mean? I gave, I have a building permit. I have a wrongful data on the which building permit is issued and I'm providing. So it practically means that all documents or legal documents for construction are wrong. So can this really be all transferred to the contractor? Can all ability really be uh, ruled with the contractor. So we went further then trying to connect provisions 412, 410 and 411 because 412 was that infamous provision stating that the employer shall have no responsibility whatsoever. Uh, so we took and we stated that the contra contract should be interpreted having in mind all relevant clauses, which is of course supported uh, with uh, local law interpretations, that the provisions of the contract are interpreted we do regard to the contract as a whole. So basically we cannot separate one provision only of the contract, which was this infamous one and say, that's it. And don't, not to take into consideration other provision of the contract, which, which might affect on the contractor's position. So the whole content of the contract should be considered during interpretation. Concrete provisions should be interpreted in light of other provisions and each provision should be given the sense which arises from the contract as a whole. So basically, even if we accept that, even if we accept that the, this provision is valid and it stands, uh, even though it is unjust, uh, we cannot look at it only that provision. So we have to look at the agreement as a whole. And because what really happened in the reality uh, or what's provided in tender documents and what the, pro the, what the effect of the project actually, have, uh, actually increased is that the increase in rock quantity was approximate 300%. It was straightened up to five times, a delay factor of 2.53. Uh, so the employer was in clear breach. And this was, the, this, this was the basically our comparison between how the project, when it was standard, should look like. And we, have, we had all this presentation, how the project should have looked like in a view of time and uh, quantity and price, and how it actually was at the end because of these additional new circumstances. So. What, were, what are lessons to be learned from this? You cannot only have the contract uh, having provision, particular conditions and general conditions or change general conditions only to the harmfulness of one party and then say it's a bulletproof. So all the, all the considerations and rights of the parties, uh, each contract and project should be looked in view of the local law and in view of interpretation of the entire contract. So this would be the conclusion. And uh, this is my presentation of DAB case. If anybody has any question for us, I think we have up to three more minutes. So we would love to answer, of course. Thank you very much. We, Jen, uh, we have uh, one question from uh, the colleague uh, uh, Neboj Šatrbajevic yeah, yeah. regarding uh, uh, the role of the expert supervisor and the engineer. Uh, Ivana, what is your opinion? Maybe I'm biased. I had yeah. uh, much better experience in the practice when uh, that was the same entity when compared uh, to the projects I, where I, the I, expert supervisor was one entity and the engineer was the other. It's a mishmash when there are two of them. That at least are my experience because you have two parties practically doing similar and different things. And yeah. uh, it, it is definitely also, in my point of view, the best to have one entity covering both to have license under the local law, which are required, and also to have the capacity of FIDIC engineer. Yes. It, yes. it was the cleanest way. Otherwise, we had a lot of situation and they, they ended badly. Yeah. yeah mostly, mostly. Okay, okay. Uh, Simon Rowland also has a question. He said, uh, thanks Nicola and Ivana for the presentation. And he asks, uh, what are your three top tips for avoiding disputes on projects? Nicola, will you go first? Well, I will definitely go first. Uh, in my opinion, uh, golden principle number five is uh, the key uh, for most of the projects. Uh, existence of uh, DAB or DAAB uh, is one of the biggest assets uh, in order to avoid the disputes. 
um, when parties have something which might become a dispute, dispute uh, if uh, there is a DAB, they can uh, refer that uh, issue to DAB and uh, take uh, some opinions uh, in advance. Uh, DAB can uh, organize the meetings and try to uh, reach a mutual uh, understanding. Uh, also, those uh, disputes are usually arising at the end of the project when the honeymoon is completed. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning, everything is great and sweet, but when the honeymoon is uh, gone, uh, the problems come to the table. So basically, uh, for me, existence of a third party, which will be present during the course of the project uh, is very important and very beneficiary compared to the costs of that project. Of course, if the project is a large scale project like uh, this uh, one was uh, that was uh, that I was talking about. Uh, my advice would be only one and not three. Sanity check, <laughs> sanity check, sanity check. Yes. Because before you go, before you actually go into dispute, you need really to do the assessment and to do the realistic assessment before and that's for in my point of view the best principle to avoid do the reality check and do the assessment what is your real position because everybody thinks they're so right when they go into dispute especially when there is a lot of years pass a lot of anger and as nicola said honeymoon has long time is long time gone and we are close to divorce and then you have really huge issues so please before any dispute that's the moment when you can actually sit down sit on the table and discuss amicable settlement and this is the dispute avoidance yeah. Or the second layer, go to DAB, check, at least check. For a small amount of money, at least check where do you stand. That's like first, second, second layer of sand to check. First would be the risk assessment, and second would be DAB, just to see if you really want to spend half a million of euros for the arbitration proceeding. That would be uh, my end of the question. Answer, sorry. Yes. Yeah, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar says it's clear breach of, yes, it's clear breach of the risk, of resp the risk and responsibilities of the parts are significant change. Yes, I absolutely agree. Nebuchadnezzar, you're 100% right. right. It, it is crazy. I agree. Da it says, happens in the practice. That's the worst unfortunately, thing. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Is it common in Serbia that the employer has to carry out geological investigation? Uh, this, this, this case could be avoided if geo investigation was responsibility of the contractor. Uh, Nikola, I think it will be more interesting for you. Then I will follow, follow up later. Uh, yes, because this was a uh, yeah. really great book. Uh, so basically the design documentation yes. was uh, uh, financed and done by and provided by the employer. The employer is engaging the designer and in order to give him uh, input uh, yeah. data, yeah. Uh, uh, geo investigation should be done by the employer. Yeah. It is basic, uh, sorry Nicola for interrupting you, under the yeah. law it is responsibility of the employer. And basically it can be transferred to the contractor, so it can be. But if you do have the red book, if you have the red book, that means the design is done by the employer, which means basically that, that you are doing it as the employer. That the employer is responsible for yeah, the design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not uh, so uncommon that in the contract, you have a stipulation where it is clearly written for the FIDIC red book uh, that uh, it is contractor's obligation to check the design and uh, to be responsible yeah, yeah. for fit for purpose. It is also not in accordance with uh, uh, FIDIX golden principles. Uh, and uh, it was uh, a practice here in Serbia to sign the uh, FIDIC red book uh, as a lump sum contract. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a Frankenstein. Yeah. We have then more questions. In what way other, uh, the other dispute is sold? A DAB. This was the DAB proceeding, uh, and it was paid. One part was paid based on the DAB proceeding, and they are still on the, for the other for the other segment. They are still trying to 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 reach some kind of an agreement, but possibly it will go to arbitration. Uh, thank you. Do we have any more questions, mm -hmm. Nicola? Do you see other questions? Yes, uh, I see uh, back to back uh, uh, contract. Uh, well, uh, I tried to simplify the, this uh, project as much as I could in order not uh, to lose the essence and to be able to present it within uh, 30 minutes. Uh, they were, uh, there were uh, seven participants in this uh, contract uh, and subcontract. So it was uh, 
uh, a real mess uh, and the government was basically financing through the international financing institution uh, and the EPC contractor did, want, did not want to accept uh, any risk for the payments toward the contractor if he did not uh, uh, receive the uh, correspondent payment from the owner. So that was a local onshore component of the works. The contractor was also uh, not uh, formally nominated, but uh, basically it was nominated. So that was the reason why back-to-back -back was applicable for the payments also. Dushan has some memories about project A and B, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a question. Do you have uh, a recommendation of an internet site or a book where they can find different quantum evaluation methods for claim verification or submissions? Sorry, I couldn't find that question. It's at the end. Yeah. Nicola, this is for you well, rather than for me. We're, we're running out of time. Yeah, so yeah, for yeah. A, a recommendation of uh, books or something, I will uh, try to include that. Anyone who requested information about the ICCP, I will include the link to the replay as well as uh, some recommendations for further reading. How about that? Super, super. And we have what does temporary protection of works by the contractor means? Nicola, this is also for you, the last one. Or oh, we have one CDP contractor. I will give you just one recommendation for the for the book. Uh, it is uh, called uh, uh, Construction Claims by Jeriko Popovic. Uh, it is a great uh, book uh, with a few examples from the from the practice. Uh, uh, you can uh, shop it online. So. Uh, maybe we can uh, give some additional recommendations on the on the site later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what does temporary protection of the works by the contractor mean? Uh, isn't it just watch and ward of the materials and site area to avoid uh, thefts? I don't know in uh, in which uh, situation temporary protection of the works for what it applies. No, we don't have an. We don't have an answer. Okay. Um, it, it is not as defined by the uh, by the FIDI contracts. Yeah. Temporary yeah. protection of the works. It's a new term. So it can mean only what is defined in the specification, if specification exists. All new terms which are not in general conditions of the contract. Uh, should have uh, their own specification explaining what the parties meant by temporary protection of the works. Okay, and um, what about C CDP? Is there any contractor design portion in Red Book? You can have it theoretically, but if you agree it in advance, so there is no issue to have it. There, there are two ways how can yeah. the contractor do the design. One is that if their parties agree in advance, uh, if uh, during the signing of the contract, it is clearly defined that the contractor shall provide certain part of the design. It is usually a smaller part uh, of the design. And the second option that the parties agree uh, after the signing of the contract, uh, that the contractor should uh, uh, design certain part of the works. Uh, however, uh, the contractor should be willing to do that. And that's it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you both very much. I'll just read the last two things that are not that are comments rather than questions. Thank okay. you both for excellent presentations. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It was our pleasure. Opportunity yes. for discussion of further details about our different understanding over the upcoming period. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, all the best wishes to you and all of the attendees for Easter holidays. Yes. Uh, happy holidays for everyone also. you celebrate. Thank you. Also. Thank you. And, also. Uh, Evan says this was a good presentation and presented arguments 
construction contracts is like a marriage contract. No <laughs> one wants to get divorced. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, make sure all the contracts are checked. Thank yeah. you. That's highlight. Exactly. Yes, that should be the take from the presentations. <laughs> all yeah. right. Great. And I, one more comment from the chat that this was one of the liveliest sessions he had attended in years. Thank so, you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It means Thank us. you very yes. much. <laughs> okay. All right. So yes, thank you both. Uh, we have gone about 10 minutes over because everyone uh, had questions so, yeah. and it was great content. So thank you for staying uh, an extra bit of time. And for everyone who has asked, the replay will be up in a few days on the ICCP YouTube channel. If you requested additional information about the ICCP when you registered, you will get that link in the email. If not, you can go to YouTube and search instruction, um, sorry, Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners and our channel will come up. Thank you all very much. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah.